A quiet day across much of the country this Wednesday afternoon, but trouble is brewing south of Mexico. And if you take a look out towards the southeast, you can see some of that Saharan dust, part of the Saharan air layer. And to a certain extent, it does show up in the model data. This is a unique chart I have here. The brown colors indicate dry conditions between 700 and 500 millibars. So that's about 10 to 20,000 feet. Anywhere that's brown is below 50, 60, 70 percent humidity. And I've also got the shear on here. This is shear that's detrimental to tropical cyclone formation. So the most favored area for development is right here. And that's where we find the intertropical convergence zone. We're going to return to that in just a little bit. Let's take a look at the climate numbers. Nothing too noteworthy here. We have shifted into a moderate El Nino, and we're showing up as phase eight in the Madden Julian Oscillation. And this time of year, that tends to be dry for Arizona, wet in parts of Texas and eastern New Mexico, but otherwise, no strong correlations this time of year. In fall, it can be wet for California. The surface analysis for this afternoon shows high pressure across the Ozarks. Cool air flowing down into the Carolinas, into Alabama and Mississippi. And we find the tail end of that front from just south of Jackson, Mississippi to about Houston and through the Austin, San Antonio area. However, it is stalled out. You can see some very hot temperatures just south of that front. With the increasing upper level flow, we've got a lee side trough from Nebraska through Colorado and a new cold front surging south from Manitoba sweeping through the Dakotas and entering central Minnesota. There's the 24-hour temperature change, definite cool down in North Dakota and Montana, and some cooler weather showing up for the southeastern U.S., but it has warmed up with that downslope flow in Colorado and parts of the High Plains. And there's the temperatures this afternoon up to 100 in Amarillo, and as we go north, hundreds all the way through eastern Colorado and up into the Scottsbluff area of western Nebraska. In the northeastern U.S., a cloudy, unsettled day. Showers from New York City up to Albany and almost all the way up towards Quebec City. In the southeastern U.S., we've got a lot of moisture and instability on hand, so SPC has a marginal risk covering almost all of Florida and much of the southeastern Carolinas. Earlier today, we had a mesoscale convective vortex move north of Tampa and Orlando. That's a look at it earlier today. You can see it drifting towards the east and probably helping to augment some of that shower and storm activity in the central part of the state. As we mentioned, a cool down in parts of North Texas and Oklahoma. Oklahoma City was down to 60 degrees, Wichita Falls 65, and Lawton, 61. Most of the excessive heat advisories have been removed, but heat advisories and a excessive heat watch remains in effect for parts of Houston and San Antonio. In the northern U.S., we've got gale warnings in the Lake Superior region, and that's due to strong southerly winds ahead of this next system and the expectation that we're going to get strong northwesterly winds in the wake of that. And that will be dragging down some of the smoke. So we do have advisories around Duluth and surrounding regions for air quality. In the western states, excessive heat warnings once again for Phoenix, Yuma, and the Imperial Valley region. A lackluster monsoon season so far, but we are going to see that monsoon really start to strengthen over the next few days. And we're going to talk about that shortly. In the northwestern U.S., excessive heat warnings for almost all of Washington, parts of Oregon, especially out there in southwestern Oregon and the coastal range. Yesterday, British Columbia set temperature records up to 107 at Warfield, which set a record for the month there, and 103 to 106 in many of the interior valleys. Later today, some high base storms may develop in the mountains of Oregon, and this time of year, that can mean wildfires breaking out from those lightning strikes. In Alaska, let's take a look up there. 
An active Gulf of Alaska system has affected that area. You can see the strong onshore flow. And it's been kind of a rainy, blustery night into this morning through the coastal regions. And up north, can't really see it very well, but there is a polar low in the Chukchi Sea. And that's causing some of this unsettled weather up along the coast. Our attention shifts to the tropics where things are starting to get busy. A couple of potential disturbances here near the Cape Verde Islands. Looking at the seven-day outlook, yeah, this is a big change. Some development on these is possible. And also an easterly wave, which is currently around the Dominican Republic, will be moving westward into the Gulf of Mexico. So here's the current picture. The shading is not precipitation. That's vorticity. And that's a way of not looking at precipitation, but instead looking at the wind field and finding where there's disturbances. And that's going to be from shear or from rotation or a combination of both. So here we've got a trough, definite rotation in the wind field. You can see the streamlines here painting out that spiral appearance. And this is part of the intertropical convergence zone. Now, the other disturbance that we're looking at is right around here, around the Dominican Republic, and as that migrates to the west, look at how that takes shape. See that oscillation in the wind flow right there? That's a trapped wave there in the tropical air mass, and it continues moving towards the west. We find it around the Florida Keys around Sunday, and then it enters the Gulf, where we have very warm sea surface temperatures, can see some amplification of that wave right there. And it continues moving to the west, into the western Gulf of Mexico, and we're expecting that to make landfall in Texas around Tuesday. The European model earlier had that going further north. The GFS, however, has been consistent with a path towards Corpus Christi or Brownsville. And we can see whether the latest European model has come into line with that. See, there's that wave out there in the Gulf, and it's still going with a northward track through the Houston, Austin, and Waco area. The timing on that may be a little bit slower, more towards Tuesday or Wednesday. So there still is some discrepancies between the two models, GFS going like that, the European model going further to the north. And of course, the other big problem, Tropical Storm Hillary coming together south of Acapulco, and that's going to be taking a track towards the north. We've got long wave troughing along the west coast, and that's going to allow for a quick recurvature. And you can see that just moving right on up Baja, California, towards Southern California. Now, this system is barely developed, so there still is some uncertainty. We could very well see it stay out to sea. We could still see it come inland, because this is about five days away at this point. However, currently it's still looking to come into California. It's been pretty consistent with that from the last four runs. And that will be a major hurricane, probably at least Category 4. It will weaken very quickly as it moves into the northern regions of Mexico due to the cold sea surface temperatures and entrainment of dry air from the west. But still, the circulation will be intact Tropical storm, force winds possible all the way up to San Diego. And you can see that tracking right up there along the coastal range. The European model has taken that a little bit further to the west. We've seen that with the past three or four runs. And that keeps the circulation well out towards Santa Catalina Island. And as that approaches the southwest, there will be a major surge in the precipitable water. This is a measure of the total moisture in the troposphere. We're looking at Thursday here. You can see the purples all the way up into the southwestern Arizona deserts. That's one and a half inches of precipitable water. So the monsoon will be picking up. And there we are for Friday. Similar pattern. The hurricane approaches during the weekend. We start to see those precipitable water amounts come up to two inches. And considering that the circulation is counterclockwise, we're going to get that strong surge coming up on the eastern flank of that storm. So this whole area will be a big belt of very rich moisture, working all the way up into Nevada, Utah, Idaho, and Wyoming towards early next week. 
And that's how things look around Tuesday is that tropical cyclone gets ripped up inland, one and a half to two inch precipitable waters across Idaho. And there will be quite a bit of residual moisture throughout this area that usually takes a while to get rid of that moisture and looks like another plume making its way up around midweek. So it looks like a wet period coming up here over the next week to two weeks. So let's take a look at the short-term forecast. Here comes that next front through Minnesota, the tail end through Wyoming and Montana. This is how things look right now. We're expecting a squall line through the Duluth area all the way up into Ontario and strong pressure gradients out there in the western Great Lakes and the arrowhead of Minnesota. Overnight, here's how things look. Squall line going through Lake Superior, northern Wisconsin and the UP of Michigan. And in the wake of that, also strong pressure gradients as well. And we will be bringing down that smoke into Minnesota and Wisconsin. The rest of the country, some showers through the southeastern U.S., weak pressure gradient. So this is all a typical late summer pattern. Troughiness through the central U.S. right there. Some return flow starting to set up in Texas. And not much going on out west, just waiting for that big hurricane to bear down. Going into Thursday, tomorrow, we see that squall line moving through Chicago and Michigan, and that will herald the approach of that cold air with this 1016 millibar high driving that polar air mass into the Midwest. So a big change for that part of the country. Elsewhere, stagnant weather and numerous showers and storms through the southeastern U.S., for tomorrow evening, that MCS squall line moves into Ohio and towards Toronto. High pressure in its wake, moving into Iowa, so northerly winds back behind that, and the tropical air located just to the south. For Friday, when we do the forecast lag program again, this is how things look. High pressure, this is the new polar high settling in across the Midwest. Return flow on its western side, and of course the usual monsoon storms in the Four Corners area. For Saturday, there's how things look. You can see that hurricanes start to approach from the south and extensive precip all the way up towards Las Vegas and Yuma. Another outbreak of cold air coming into the northern plains. And that's about as far as this chart sequence gets, but that's a Another good push of cold air coming into the northern U.S. And wow, yeah, look at those spiral bands down towards the south. So we pick things up with the GFS. There will be quite a bit of heat in this part of the country. Friday and Saturday, highs up to 104 at Pierre, South Dakota for Friday. Moving eastward, Omaha will be up to 102 on Saturday and 103 at Wichita. And this will show you the change on the upper level chart. This is what we have right now. Subtropical ridge across the central U.S. You can see the troughiness off the west coast there. And strong westerlies in central Canada. Then going into the weekend, we see this high start to build across the south central U.S. and into the Corn Belt. And check this out by Sunday night. We start to see the 600 decameter contour, which is quite rare, but there it is. So that's indicative of very warm weather in that part of the country. This is Sunday evening, and you can see that hurricane out there start to make its effect on the 500 millibar pattern. So 600 decameter contour going into Monday, so we'll continue that hot weather in that part of the country. Strong southerly flow bringing up the monsoon moisture. That's a conveyor belt from the tropics going right on up there through the Intermountain region and the Rockies. And we will get a period of very cool weather around that time, Monday and Tuesday. Highs in the 80s and lower 90s, but that will come up rapidly as we go into Tuesday and Wednesday. And there's the total rainfall expected over the next seven days. Expecting up to three to four inches in southern Nevada through the California deserts, down Baja California, and lesser amounts, one to two inches, well up to the north. 
And of course, there is some uncertainty in this because a lot of it depends exactly where the hurricane goes. However, in the central U.S., continuing that drought weather. There's how the drought conditions looked back in May. Drought across Kansas, the panhandles, has improved a little bit since then. There's June, there's July, and that's the latest data that we have. So any rains they can get in that area of the country would be beneficial, but this pattern is not helping them very much. And that's all we have for this edition of Forecast Lab. Be sure to check back in on Friday for an update. Thanks to Aaron and Andrew McLaughlin Music, David Rice, and Bob Johnson. Thank you very much for those Patreon donations. That's very helpful. Anyway, we'll see you back here in a couple days. Stay safe, stay cool, and hope you have a great Wednesday evening. Bye-bye.